This morning, I just want to, I want to start with a question. And I want to see how many here in 2015, there was this great thing called the, a general conference or the GC. Um, who here was there in 2015? Who here has ever been to a general conference? Who here has no clue what a general conference is? <laughs> if you have no clue, don't worry. I didn't either till last year or in 2015. It was my first time going also. And what it is, is the general conference is where it's, it's literally that. It's a general conference where Adventists from all over the world get together. And in 2015, it was in San Antonio. And there was projected to be about 75,000 Adventists. Now, that's a lot of haystacks. <laughs> but, you know, I just want to share with you real briefly my experience there. Because, you see, when I was at the first GC, I had the opportunity to work there. I was in charge of a group of Southwestern students, and it was our job to booth all or to man every single information booth at the general conference. And it was a big endeavor, and it was, it was a really interesting job. Uh, my, my favorite thing is I had a gentleman come up to me, and he brought his phone to me. I was at an information booth, and he's like, sir, my phone broke. Can you fix it? And I was like, no, no, sir, uh, what, what, what provider do you have? He's like, at and I'm like, well, here's a store, or you know, here's a place you can go. He's like, no, but I want you to fix my phone. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. He's like, but your information. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And the, the second thing I loved is I'd have people come up to me, and you know, as I said, 70 to 75,000 Adventists, and they come up to me and say, do you know where so-and-so is? And, uh, and, you know, I happened to be in the, the auditorium where all the, um, the reps were as they were talking, going through the meetings. And I was like, well, are they in there? And they're like, no, 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 they're, they just came from, this is their first time, was telling me their whole life story. And I was, like, I was like, I'm sorry, I have no clue where so-and-so is. But a really cool, rewarding thing was, is what we could do is if people came to us and if they were in the main session, uh, we could be those people where, they, where they gave us a whiteboard and we could put their name, put what conference they're from, and we would walk in to uh, where all the meetings are going with, with thousands of people and we would hold the signs. And it was interesting because, you know, you're going to a group of uh, 100 people from, you know, let's say the North American Division and you have a random name and you see the wave of people nudging each other and pointing and pointing and then finally the one person stands up and they come to you and sometimes they're like, we have no clue where they are. Or sometimes they're like, hey, that's, that's me. And it was one of the most amazing experiences, you know, take this person back to the person who asked for him, and they would be like, you know, this is the person who raised me, or this was my teacher. I haven't seen him for 20 years. And I remember this one person, I, um, I, I, held, I was there for the reunion, and they were just crying and holding each other. And I was just like, wow, this is so amazing. But also during my experience there at the General Conference, I learned something about Glow Track Ministries. Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, those little glow tracks that we do every uh, first Sabbath of the month that we, you know, we offer a handout, I'll tell you, before General Conference, I did not believe in them. I'm sorry. I was, you know, I was just like, I don't know if they're going to work. But the interesting, at General Conference, I worked, and there was a security staff from San Antonio. And while I was there, you know, we, I, I once got the, I was talking to a young man named Carlos. Um, Carlos came from a really, um, you could say, checkered background where, you know, he, he had run from the cops, he had all the, you know, just, he had, he had the story. And we were just talking, having a good time, and he started asking us about what we believed in. And all the information booths, they gave us a little packet of glow tracks. And so I was there, I was thumbing through them, and I read through them, and I was like, wow, these are really good. So I was like, you know what, here, take this one. It was a love letter from Jesus. And this, this young man, Carlos, who's in his 20s, he reads it. And luckily, like, I was the booth here, and he was working right over there. And he would put it on this desk as he was standing there doing security. And he would read it, and then he'd walk over and be like, do you have another one? And I was like, yeah. So I, I just kept, you know, giving him out. And I was stealing glow tracks from all my friends. And the amazing thing is finally, he's like, you know, I want to go to church. And so I gave him, you know, the, a pastor's number. I got his number, connected him with a pastor. I don't know where he is. But it was amazing to see the power of Glow Tracks, the power of the general conference, of just having people together who believe in Jesus Christ and who are passionate about Jesus Christ and seeing how just us being there can influence someone else. But this morning, I want to take us back to the early church. And I want to take us back to the first ever general conference session where the president wasn't Ted Wilson, 
but it was James, the brother of Jesus. So this morning, as we go back to the first ever general conference session, I'd like for us just to start with a word of prayer. So if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Do me follow, Lord, our God. Lord God, you are so wonderful. And Lord, as we take this moment just to dig into your word, I just pray that you open our hearts, that you help us see the message you have for us this, this morning, and that, Lord God, we may truly be in your presence. We love you, Lord, and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. 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 Um, just as we start, I just want to get the elephant out of the room. If you hear the ringing, don't worry, it's not your ears. We don't know, it just started, I'm sorry. But you know, sometimes the devil creates distractions to keep us away from his message. So maybe there's something you need to hear today. So don't let this distraction keep you away. But this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts, Acts chapter 15. And we're gonna see the start to the first ever general conference session of the early church. And we're gonna start in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse one. And when you get there, give me a, a hearty amen. 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 And God's word says, and, a certain me, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised, according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small talk, talk and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So it was being sent on their way by the church. They passed through uh, Phoenicia, Fen 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 Samaria, descri uh, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they, they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, who believed rose up saying, if it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So here we see the first ever general conference session is started with a problem. You see, there's a group that says, to be saved, you must be circumcised. Now for us in, a, in today's society, in Western mind frame, we think that's just weird. That doesn't sound, that doesn't make any sense to us. But what you gotta understand is during this time, if, if a Gentile, which what were the Gentiles, but anybody who wasn't Jews. So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So, so just so we see the frame of reference, but say before Jesus came, if you were a Gentile and you wanna become a Jew, to become a Jew, you had to be circumcised. So this was, this was for them a really practical issue. This was a common sense issue. So this wasn't to us some weird thing, but you see behind this issue, there were some other issues. And we'll see this as we continue reading this. But you see, there was the issue of eating food offered to gods. Because during this time, you know, the, the pagans, they would offer the food to their gods and then they'd go sell it. And when you were shopping, you didn't know, you, you could go to someone and maybe it was cheaper, I don't know, but you could buy food that was offered to gods. And the second thing is that there was a custom and with the Greeks and with the Gentiles that they liked to eat meat that was strangled. So since it was strangled, that means all the blood was left in with the meat. And the third thing is that the Gentiles, they actually liked to cook with blood. So as they were cooking, they would put the blood in and that'd be kind of like a seasoning. That was common for him. And finally, the last issue that was all tucked into this issue of circumcision was sexual immorality. Because you see, for the Greeks, for the people of the time, for the Romans, marriage was a lot different than it is today. You see, most men were, had a wife, but most men had one to two concubines. And what a concubine was, let's say you have a daughter, and during this time, your daughters didn't have any rights. You know, women were seen as property. It's, it's not like today. So to make sure she's okay, you would give your daughter to a man as a concubine because you know at least she'll be taken care of. She'll be safe. And so here we're seeing this. There's this mess up view of marriage and this is all tucked together into this one issue of circumcision. And so before we continue, I just want us to look at why did God have the Jews be circumcised? You know, for us, it doesn't make sense, but you know, for God, it was a way to show that they were separate from the world. 
not only religiously and spiritually, but physically. Because you see, the, the religions at that time, there was a group, have you ever read in the Bible where it said they worship in the high places? Do you know what that was? When they, when they worship in the high places, many times they would try to recreate these high places to be like Garden of Edens where they try to make it look beautiful. And a lot of times up there, they would worship the god Bel. We, all, we have all heard, if you read the Bible, you see the, this god called Bel all the way throughout it. And, the god, and Bel was the god of the weather. And it was believed by going up there and by committing sexual immorality that you couldn't please the god to make it rain. So by doing this, by being circumcised, when the Jews went up there, they had a physical reminder that they don't worship Bel, but they worship God. And they had a reminder when they went up there, everybody around them knew that they were a Jew. There was no hiding the fact that they were doing something they know they weren't. So here we see that this circumcision problem, you know, it, it was a real problem. It, it made sense to them, even though it might not make sense to us. But let's continue. Let's, let's go to verse, go with me to verse 6. It says, Now the apostles and elders came together, came together to consider the matter. And I just want you to know, the distance from Antioch to Jerusalem was 250 miles. So when Paul and Barnabas and these Jews left, it wasn't, you know, sometimes we read the Bible and we think it happened the next day. No, 250 miles and they didn't have, you know, Ubers or planes or anything like that. So they had to walk it and it says that they went and visited all these other churches and knowing how pastors talk, it could took them like six months. So, but, but we don't know. It doesn't tell us a time frame, but we know that it didn't happen the next day. But here for the general conference session, all the major churches, all the who's who's in the early church <clears throat> are there to face this problem. And you know, and I can imagine as this problem comes up, they're, they're probably worried about it, don't you think? But I, I want to read a few, a quote from the Acts of the Apostles, page 192, it says, and as talking about the setting up of this problem and what's going on, it says, but the Holy Spirit had in reality already settled this question upon the decision of which seemed best to depend the prosperity and if not the very existence of the Christian church. And I want you to notice this, as there was a big problem in the church, guess what? God already had the answer. And I just want to tell you, if there is a big problem in your life, guess what? God already has the answer. Yesterday I got the opportunity to, uh, to speak at Chisholm Trail Academy and to talk to our kids and we talked about stress. And I don't know if you knew this, but did you know that stress is one of the leading epidemics in America right now? Do you know that stress is one of the greatest factors for illness? You know, in the Ministry of Healing, it says that 90% of ailments are because of mental diseases. But what researchers are discovering is that when you're stressed, you, re you release a chemical called adrenaline. And we're all familiar with adrenaline, right? It's that fight or flight. And the power of adrenaline is quite interesting. When I was in high school, I was in gymnastics. And I remember our coach, before every show, would have the adrenaline talk. Because you see, when you, when you have adrenaline pumping, you're stronger, you're faster, you don't think as clear. And he would be like, when you have adrenaline, when you go out to perform, you're going to have a lot of adrenaline. You're going to be really hyper, you're going to be really active. And he said, and he would always talk to us, be like, make sure you calm that down. Make sure you keep that in mind before hitting a move because you have people's hands in your life. And I remember one day, uh, my buddy and I, we were doing something called an instant three high. So an instant three high is there's two bases like this, one on this side and one on this side. And behind it was me and my buddy and we had a girl. And what we do is on the count, on the count when they all go up, they all go straight up. And then at the same time, we throw the girl up. So it goes up and lands. It's a really, like, I, looking back, I'm like, how did we do that? But our coach said to do it, so we did it. So, but I remember one show, we were doing this move, and adrenaline kicked in. And as adrenaline kicked in, you know, my buddy and I, we took a lot of pride in always having the perfect height. This is before, these are before, the, uh, before Christ, the BC years. But 
we took a lot of pride and always, you know, we're like, oh, we're the best, yeah, yeah. But what happened when came the showtime, the adrenaline kicked in, and with the extra energy, we threw her and she went over the pyramid. But I praise the Lord that adrenaline kicked in and my buddy and I were able to go around the pyramid and catch her. <laughs> but you see, this is the power of adrenaline. It gets your body running. And you know what happens? When you are stressed, when you're anxious, when you're fearful, adrenaline is being pumped into your body. You know, when I was in, uh, when I was in college, we had to take a class called Hospital Ministries. And I'll be honest, when I was going to go take the class, I was scared about it. Because I don't know about you, but the thought of going into a stranger's hospital room and try to dig into the crevice of their lives kind of scared me. I was kind of afraid of like, you know, coming in and I had no clue what I was doing. But you know, <clears throat> our professor, Theo Stewart, who's in charge of the, the chaplains at Hughley, he shared with us a statistic that some researchers at Harvard did. And they showed that if, as a chaplain, you go in and you help them resolve that inner conflict in their heart, that you can reduce their time at the hospital by 85%. So imagine this, we're all sick. We're all sick and we have to be at the church for 10, or not, not the church, I'm sorry. We all have to be at the hospital for 10 days, all of us. And a chaplain comes in and, and he's able to mend that, that inner conflict in us. Our stay there is cut down by 85%. So that 10 day went to a day and a half. So when I entered the room and I told them the statistic, you know, first you had those grumpy people like, why are you here? Da, da. But then I tell them, they're like, stay all day, you know? But you see, this is the power of stress. This is the power of anxiety. And even more, a researcher, he was working at a mental ward. And he discovered that if he could get his patient to believe that their sins were forgiven. This is a mental ward where you have people with the straight jackets. If he could get their patients to believe that, they would be, that their sins were forgiven, he said that they could leave the next day. That they could leave the next day. And yesterday as we looked, we looked at the story of Jesus calming the sea. We know that story, right? He's asleep on the boat and a storm comes. His disciples are all afraid. But then when Jesus wakes up, he's, he's asleep in a storm. And I don't know about you, but when it rains and it thunders, I wake up. Who here is ever waking up when it thunders and it... But Jesus is asleep through it all. And when he does wake up, he is peaceful. He isn't worried about it. He's not fearful about it. And he calms the storm. And you know, as we look at this, we see this is what a life that is completely surrendered to God looks like. Because did you know that we weren't made to be stressful? We weren't made to be scared. We weren't made to be fearful. But we were made to be victorious. Amen. And you know, I don't know if I want to take it this far, but it could be possible but that being fearful and being stressed could be a sin. Because Scripture says that be anxious in nothing in Philippians 4, 6. And in 1 John 4, 18, it says, perfect love casts out what? Yeah. All fear. And so, my friends, we were made to be victorious. We were made to live lives that wasn't stressful, that wasn't anxious, that wasn't fearful, but to perfectly trust in God. But you know what? As soon as we gave our life to Jesus, we were guaranteed that our life would be full of problems. You know why? Because we have an adversary, the devil, who doesn't want us to, see, to live these victorious lives. And he'll do whatever he can to put roadblocks, to put problems in your way, to try to stress you out. So I promise you, until Jesus comes, you and I, we're going to have problems. The church is going to have problems. The government's going to have problems. But guess what? We can trust in Jesus Christ. Because the same hands that calm the storm are the same hands that can get us through whatever problem is going on. So we were made to be victorious and not to stress. But I want us to go back to the story. I want us to look once again and see what happens. Go back with me to Acts chapter 15, verse 7. And it says, And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to the men and brethren, You know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the hearts, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. 
and he made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Therefore, why do we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And I just want to say, I praise, I praise the Lord that God wants to see everyone saved. Amen? He doesn't want just America to be saved. He doesn't want just Cleburne to be saved. But he wants everyone to be saved. And you know what? What's so interesting is who's saying this? Peter, right? And Peter was the same person, the same person who was at first against sharing the gospel to the Gentiles. Remember, God had to give him a dream and it had to have Cornelius go to his doorstep to open his eyes to share the gospel to everybody else. And you know, when I read that, it just gives me some hope because I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be a little stiff-necked. I can be a little stubborn. But you know what? There's still hope for me because God is willing to lead me to his truth. And I just want to invite you, as you're studying God's word, just to surrender your life to him. As you're living your day, just to surrender your life to him. Because if God had to lead Peter, how much more does he have to lead you and I? So I just challenge you, you know, every time when I, when I read the Bible, I always say, God, God right now, I just want to be in your presence. Show me whatever you want me to show me, but don't let me leave until I've been in your presence. And you know what? I never leave without a blessing. You know, in, in our lives, when we go to God and we surrender our lives to Him, He will show us what we need to know. Because you know the cool thing is about the Bible? Everything we learn from the Bible is from Him. Never can we get a blessing out of the Bible that wasn't directly from God. But let's go back to our story because after Peter's done talking, we have somebody else talk. So go with me to verse 11 and we'll finish up what Peter said. He says, But we believe that through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Amen. Verse 12, Then all the multitudes kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God worked through them among the Gentiles. So here we see Peter talks, and Barn, uh, then Paul and Barnabas talk, but then someone else comes up to talk. And we see in verse 13 it says, And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And I, I just want to stop right there. You know the, the phrase where it said a people for his name? Do you know that's the same phrase used to, to, to represent the children of Israel? So what's so amazing is that God's saying, even out of the Gentiles, out of everyone, I have my people. And he continues to say, and with this, the word of the prophets agree just as is written, verse six, 16 says, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will lift it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should, and this is James speaking, therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. And I just want you to see, as they're faced with this problem, the early leaders do th three things. They share their personal testimony on how God has led them to this decision. They show how the Holy Spirit has been working. And finally, they go, they go, and most importantly, they go to the Bible. Whenever there's a problem through these three, through these three means, we can always find the solution through, through prayer and through following the Bible. But I, but I want us to continue. <clears throat> As we continue to find out, what was the verdict? He says, therefore I judge, verse 19, therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among, among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, that's food that's, food that's uh, offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from th things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And then notice verse 20, 22, it says, 
Then it pleased the apostles, the elders, with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, and namely Judas, who was also named Barabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So here we see that they finally, they find a solution. They find the solution. And that's, and that's it. They go out and they tell everybody. But I want us to go back to the certain Jews. Because as we look at them, behind the circumcision, behind these Jews, the Jews that were bringing up were Pharisees who followed Moses' law, who were bringing up this issue. And the bottom line, one the, the, when the bottom lines behind it is that they were trying to point out that by a physical thing, they were better than the Gentiles. By being circumcised, they were saved. But you know what? How are we saved? By faith, through the grace of God. You see, there's nothing physical we can do to make us closer to heaven. All we can do is surrender our lives to God and let Him work on our hearts. And that's, that's all that matters. Being circumcised and being not, not circumcised, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is by believing Jesus Christ and that he's coming soon. And you know, with that said, we need to remember that none of us, none of us are more important or more special than anyone else. We can't get the mindset of the Pharisees thinking just because we come to church that we're better than anybody else, just because we have a special paycheck, just because we drive a special car. You know what the bottom line is? You and I, we're all sinners. I want you to do this. I want you to find someone next to you and I want you to point at them and say, you are a sinner. I want you to do that. Point at them, get your finger out, get that finger waving and say, you are a sinner. It does, it does that feel good? You got all that judgmental out of your system. All right, now I want you to take that wavy finger and I want you to point it back at yourself and I want you to look at that same person and say, I am a sinner. But now I want you to point to heaven and I want you to say, but I was saved by grace. And my friends, that's all that matters. We have been saved by grace because Jesus Christ came to this earth. He came to this dark and dreary earth and he paid the price so that you and I could be free from sin. But you know what also is amazing? Go with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, because not only did he pay the price that we could be forgiven, but in John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, it says, John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor with the will of man, but of God. My friends, through Jesus Christ, we are no longer sinners, but we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, God. Amen. And you see, because of that, our concern can't be anything of this word. We can't let our problems weigh us down because our concerns must be the same as our Father in Heaven. You know what? I'm going to tell you. God isn't concerned about politics in the church. He's not concerned about politics in general. You know what God's concerned about? He's concerned about the people outside these doors. The homeless man that has no hope. Of the husband, who do, the husband who's addicted to alcohol and who abuses his family. You can see God is concerned about the young person right now who is contemplating suicide because he believes that no one loves him. You see, this is what God's concern is. And my friends, I don't know about you, but I want my concern to be the same as our Heavenly Father's, don't you? You see, all this other stuff is just distraction. What matters is going to heaven, doesn't it? And I don't know about you, but I want to be in heaven. And you know, we are too close to eternity to let problems get in our way, to let things get in between us and God. We are too close. And my friends, I don't know about you, but today is the day that we surrender everything to our Heavenly Father. And we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And we say, God, my only concern is going to heaven. 
and invite every single person I meet on the way to come with me. And that's our prayer. That's what matters. And that is the biggest problem we have, is what are we going to do in eternity with Jesus and others? And if that is your desire, will you pray with me? Dear me, Father, Lord, our God, God, we know in this world that we will have a lot of problems. We know that life won't be easy. But God, we are given the peace that passes all understandings, knowing that you will be there every step of the way. And that God, the same hands that come to see are the same hands that want to hold our life. And Lord God, we know that there are people outside who are hurting, who need to know you. And God, just pray that you unite us under one Savior, under one mission, and that, God, we can be the people that you have ordained and destined us to be. Lord God, we love you, and we know you're coming soon. And may we be ready. In your name I pray. Amen.